Hello and welcome. My name is Amanda and this is my channel, Her Pacific Northwest Washington Life. And today I wanted to share with you all of the books that I read in the month of June. So I had another reading month where I did pretty well, um, both in the number of books that I read, but also in the ratings that I gave books. I have my first five star rating of the year. <laughs> and a couple more four-star ratings. So I'm really excited about these books. The first book I finished, oh, as well, I also participated in three readathons this month. I had the Make Your Myth Taker readathon, which was the full month of June, and the week of the 22nd through 28th, I participated in both the Camp Bookland readathon that was hosted by Paige over at Creating & Co., as well as the Visit Hogsmeade readathon hosted by G over at Book Roast. So with three readathons and 30 days in the month, we did pretty well. The first book I read was a buddy read, and this is the Lord of, um, excuse me, this is The Return of the King by J.R.R. Tolkien, which is the final book in the Lord of the Rings series. I have been reading, rereading this series with my friend Rainy over at the channel Rainy Day Reads, and we were doing this. Um, I had wanted to reread Lord of the Rings this year, and then Rainy told me about the Lord of the Read Along that was being hosted by Sarah over at Sarah's Nightstand and Krista over at Books and Jams for the first half of this year. So we decided to join in. Um, this book was supposed to span June and July, and we finished it, I think it was the first week of June. Um, so we flew through it, and it was just really good to be, again, back in this world. Um, I have recently re-watched all of the movies. We actually watched them with my son recently. It was his first time seeing them, and he absolutely loved these films. Um, so it was good to be able to revisit this story in book format because I forgot that, um, the story ends, like, with the big throwing the ring into Mordor, um, or Mount Doom, and Sauron coming to an end and everything being all happy, dandy-go-lucky again is about halfway through this book and then the journey back to the Shire is what takes up the most like the end of the book and I forgot that um when the hobbits get back to um it's mostly when they get back to Bree um before they actually get into Hobbiton that um hard times have finally hit the Shire though they don't exactly know to what extent um, they didn't have orcs and things coming in, but they did have some pretty bad hobbitses and um, some of Saruman's influence come into them. So the Shire has changed a little bit and the people are trying to protect themselves as best as they can. And we have, you know, Merry and Pippin come sweeping in and taking care of things and kicking butt and taking names. Um, and then through to, like, fin ha uh, Frodo finishing off the book that he and Bilbo started and handing that off to Sam and then Frodo deciding that um, he went through a lot with uh, destroying the ring and he can't settle back into life in the Shire anymore so he is given the opportunity by the elves to go um, across the sea and from their um, Frodo leaving Sam and ugh, that made me cry when Sam finally realized that Frodo had to leave and that Sam wanted to go with, but he had started a family with Rosie, so he couldn't. Um, so just being reminded of all the great stuff that this book has, uh, I absolutely enjoyed my buddy read um, so much, especially being able to chat about all of our feelings and the events and things that happen within this book. Um, four star read for me. I listened to this on Audible uh, for this time of rereading it and it was an 18 hour and 19 minute audiobook. Um, there's also appendices in the back and part of the audiobook had Appendix A which had some really good information about um, the age after uh, the destruction of their ring. So I thought that was really cool to read. 
The next book I picked up was Veins of Magic by Emma Hamm, which is the second book in the Otherworld series, and this is a book that I have on my Kindle. It was 368 pages that I gave a three-star rating. Um, the first book is kind of loosely based off of Beauty and the Beast, so it's a bit of a Beauty and the Beast retelling, and Veins of Magic just follows on from there, um, we have Sorsha who is returned to the mortal world where she is trying to take care of her father and sisters with the blood beetle plague that has taken over um, the whole village. But Sorsha really wants to get back to Eamon who was, um, and he was cast out from his family. He was supposed to be the next king of the Fae, of the Seelie Fae, and um, his brother was not a very nice person, uh, or not a very nice fae, um, who's his twin, and he always wanted the power, so he backstabbed, literally, Aemon, and, um, then banished him from the land, so, um, Sorcia really wants to get back to Aemon, uh, there's lots of battling that goes on, we get different, um, fae creatures, like pixies, and dwarves, and goblins, and, Kelpies again, um, and it's just a really fun world to be in. Um, I enjoyed this. I think there it could have probably been a little condensed. I remember, um, I don't remember the finer points or my exact feelings as I was reading, but I do remember that I felt a little underwhelmed by what happened and like the plot just kind of dragged on a little bit. So it would have been nice if things have been just a little tighter. Um, Think it would have been great. The next book I picked up was The Forgotten Garden by Kate Morton. This was another book I had on Audible that was 20 hours and 37 minutes that I gave a four star rating. It's the first Kate Morton book I've read and I really really enjoyed this story. Um, we follow basically three um, different timelines. So we have a young girl who, um, named Nell who boards a boat in England and she ends up making a journey by herself with no parents to Australia and um, there gets adopted by a man who works on the docks um, after they can't find her family. Um, and when she becomes an adult, the dad who adopts her finally decides to disclose that she was adopted um, and gives her her white suitcase that she was found with and um, basically the only information they know. And in this suitcase is a book of fairy tales um, and Nell only remembers certain things. She remembers this woman called the authoress and that's pretty much it. Um, so from there we meet, um, oh it's not Catherine and I don't think it's Cassidy, Cassandra, that's her name, um, who is a granddaughter of Nell, who was abandoned by her mom um, into the care of Nell. So Nell is like her person um, they've been there for each other through thick and thin, and um, when Nell passes away, Cassandra learns about Nell's past and wants to learn more about that. So she makes the journey to England, and um, she's also got a past that she has struggled with and is dealing with, and she comes upon this cottage that was left to her in Nell's will and um, from there pieces of the puzzle and Nell's background get knit back together. Um, we also follow prior to Nell um, there's this lady called the authoress and um, her backstory and things like that um, and it's just it's a beautiful story I really enjoyed it and it makes me really want to read more from Kate Morton so I would highly suggest this one. Um, the next book I read was The Last Namsara by, um, is it Kristen Cicerelli? I think that might be it. I don't have the name written down. I listened to this via Scribd and it was 11 hours and 14 minutes that I gave a four star rating. I also own this on my Kindle and I have been putting it off because 
Um, the one thing that I really don't like in books is animal cruelty, and I knew that this had a main character in it who was a dragon slayer, and it was her her task to go and hunt down all these dragons. So after learning that, um, I really wasn't keen on picking this up just knowing about its content, but I had to swap out a book for the Make Your Myth Taker Readathon, and this was one that fit because it had a foiled cover, so I decided to pick it up, and I was pleasantly surprised by it. Um, so I believe the main character's name is Asha. Um, she is the daughter of the king, and she has been scarred by a dragon in the past. He's, I think, like the oldest dragon, and he's kind of the big bad honcho dragon or whatever. I don't... <laughs> just ignore me. Um, but he, he's a pretty bad dragon that they need to vanquish. Um, so we learn a lot about her past and her past maybe isn't what she thought it was or what she grew up, um, being told it was. Uh, there's a bit of a love story in this and, um, just kind of a realization of what she's been told in the past and, um, what she wants to believe for the future and things like that. So I did really enjoy this and it makes me want to finish the other books in the series. It's a trilogy, I believe, and I think they're all, it's complete. So I'm definitely going to be picking up the next couple of books. The next book I read was The Gold Sun by Carrie Ann Noble. And I read this on my Kindle. I think I also own this one on Audible, but it was a 306 page um, Kindle book that I gave a four star rating takes place in Ireland and we follow this boy named Toman who is an apprentice to a shoemaker and he lives with his grandma um, and one day there is a man with his niece that comes into the shop who wants a special pair of shoes made and um, what Toman doesn't know is that this man might not be human. Um, Tillman has also dealt with all his life um, an itching in his palms and a need to steal, so his grandma nicknamed him Magpie. And um, from there, lots of events and shenanigans happen. Um, we go underground into the fairy world. I'm not going to tell you which types of fairies we follow because I think it's a little more fun to, I don't know, piece that together or be told within the story. Um, and things like that. So uh, I really enjoyed The Gold Sun. I thought this was middle grade, but it's more young adult. And I thought it was just a lot of fun. I've been really enjoying fairy books this year, and it's not common, I guess, for me to read books that involve the fae, but I did really like this one. So the next book I read was another reread, and that was Spellslinger by Sebastian de Castell, and this was a buddy read I did with my friend Eric at Break Even Books. I listened to this on audiobook this time around because the first time I read it on my Kindle, and I felt like I was missing out on a lot of the pronunciation, but um, come to find out I was actually pronouncing things okay. So this one was a 10 hour and 58 minute audiobook that I gave a three star rating, which is the same rating I gave it the first time around. I do not recommend the audiobook. Um, I did not like the narrator. It might be for some people, but it definitely wasn't for me. Um, he, he did Kellen's voice very well. Um, but then <laughs> girls voices like Kellen's sister Shala, I didn't feel like were done well. And when Ferris Parfax and um, Rikus, I think is the shadow, uh, the squirrel cat's name come in, he does this southern drawly accent that I, to me, doesn't fit. Um, so it was kind of comical to listen to, but not very enjoyable. So this follows um, 15, almost 16 year old Kellen, who is hoping to sit the mage's trial so that way he can become Shatep um, and a mage like his family and not be, I guess, demoted to Shantep, which are um, people of his race that don't snap their bands and don't become Jean, uh, Shatep and don't pass the mage's trial. 
So at a young age, these kids get these bands tattooed into their skin. And as they learn to wield magic, assuming they can use magic, um, these bands snap and they can yield or use that magic that corresponds with the band and the metal and stuff. So you have stuff like breath magic and um, I think iron is one. Um, and you've got other things like that. So Kellen is just a couple days away from hitting his 16th birthday. And if he doesn't pass his major's trial by the time he's 16, he becomes Gentep. And his magic has slowly been fading and he doesn't know why. Um, he can form the, I think they're called somatic runes perfectly. He knows the proper verbiage and how you're supposed to say the spells and all that good stuff. But for whatever reason, uh, magic just keeps eluding him. And then in comes Farius Parfax, who is a mysterious character, don't really know a lot about her origin, and she puts it in Kellen's brain that maybe magic is a con game, and maybe you don't need magic to be able to defeat people who do have magic. And from there, so many things go on and happen, and um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I struggled with this book the first time I read it. I almost DNF'd it because it does have animal cruelty in it, which I don't appreciate, like I said earlier. And reading through it this time around via audiobook, it was okay because I was listening to it at faster than normal speed. So the section that really had the part that bothered me uh, the first time around, uh, we I flew through it a lot faster. So it didn't hit me as hard, um, but... I still, um, it is bothersome for me. So that does like bring down my enjoyment a bit, but I am really curious about this world and what Kellen is going to do after the events of Spellslinger. So I do plan on continuing it. And I think maybe Eric and I might be better reading more of the books, but um, I think we'll pick up Shadow Black in August, uh, but I'm not entirely sure. So the next book I have, another book that I can finally hold up, is Blanca Iroha by Anna Marie McLemore. This is a 367 page book that I gave a 4 star rating. It was my most anticipated book of 2018 that I never got around to. Um, and this is a, I always heard of it as a Swan Lake retelling, which it is. Um, there is definitely a heavy influence of the Swan Lake Ballet. But this is more so a Snow White and Rose Red retelling um, with a Latina, um, I guess, flair to it. Which is something that Anna Marie McLemore wanted to see more of when she was a young girl. But we follow two sisters, Blanca Iroha, and a family curse that was put upon them by a couple generations past, um, where the swans decide um, between two sisters whether one of them is staying human or whether and which one is being turned into a swan. So Blanca and Roja do all these things where they try to make it appear to the swans as if they are the same person or if they're one person um, in order so that they can kind of defeat this curse and um, so that the swans don't pick either one of them. We also have two boys that come in. Um, we have Yearling who has a family with a, a very shady past in history that he has found out about and he's not okay with. So he, um, he tries to run away from that. Um, we also have Paige who is a transgender boy. Um, he likes to be called either he or she, but does not want to be referred to as um, young lady or girl. So um, Paige is also um, Yearling's best friend, and um, there's magical realism elements in this with the woods that they live near and things that happen to the boys within those woods, and the girls... Um, I guess, fight and struggle to basically defeat this curse um, <laughs> is the best way I can explain it without giving any spoilers. I think this is, 
her writing is just so beautiful and lyrical. Um, the chapters are very short, so this is really easy to fly through. And I feel like this is also a perfect fall pick because um, it does take place, I believe, in October. So you get the changing of the leaves and kind of that autumnal weather. And you also get, um, there's an apple farm that kind of plays a bit of a role in this. And that always just makes me think of the fall time. Um, so this is just a very beautiful book. Really looking forward to reading more by her. I think the only other book that is published solely by her um, that I have left is Dark and Deepest Red. I think is the title and I, I believe she's also written some books um, like co-authored books as well that I might have to look into. The I'm gonna bundle two books together because they are the um, last two books in a series so I listened to Heartless and Timeless by Gail Carriger through my library. Heartless was 11 hours and 20 minutes that I gave a two-star rating and Timeless was 11 hours and 26 minutes that I gave a three-star rating. These are the final books in the Parasol Protectorate series that is a fun little steampunk series. Um, we follow Alexia Terabody, who is this thing called a soulless. So she doesn't have a soul. Um, and she can do, I guess, some things to some supernatural creatures that... Uh, basically take away their supernatural ability. Um, we've also got werewolves, the most prominent uh, figure being Conal McCon, and then we also have vampires. And this, these books, um, Heartless took place, I think, all in London, and Timeless took place mostly in London, and then also in Egypt. Um, so we just follow on lots of the shenanigans that these series has. Um, I I don't really want to explain what goes on in these books just in case you're interested in the series I don't want to spoil anything but um, we've we've got uh, just some supernaturally things that go on that uh, Alexia kind of has to manage um, in order to I guess keep the peace between all of the different supernatural sectors and things like that the next book I read was Crystal Storm by um, Morgan Rhodes, and this is the fifth book in the Fallen Kingdom series, which is a series that I originally read the first four books um, a couple years ago, and then I don't think the fifth book was out just yet, so I, I was waiting for it to be done, and then by the time this book got published, I decided I needed to do a reread because there is this book and the final book, which is called Immortal Rain, that I haven't read. Um, we follow, or it takes place in this, mostly in this land called Mitica, that is split into three separate countries. You have Lameros to the north, Pelsia in the central, or center, and Aranos in the south. And we've got the King of Blood, um, Gaius de Mora, who is the King of Lameros, and decides that that's not good enough. Um, he has always been told that he is destined to be this great, powerful being and rule the world, essentially. And so he invades um, Aranos with the help of Pelsia and takes over from there and we've got um I hate to love romance in here there is also elemental magic here um there's also these beings called the watchers and these orbs called the kindred that have their own individual roles to play within this series I think it's a lot of fun um some people compare it to the young adult game of thrones or say it is the young adult game of thrones I guess um but it is quite tropey and the plot does get repetitive um it also kind of has a little roundabout way and it's very predictable um and the author is not nearly as brutal uh, which is probably why it's young adult with her characters as George R. R. Martin is but it's still a lot of fun and I have been enjoying rereading the first four books and then um, just my continuation of the series. So I am really looking forward to finishing off the series next month. 
The last book I listened to uh, was another Audible pick, and it was Lion by Saru Brierly, which is a memoir. This is also called A Long Way Home, and it was 7 hours and 28 minutes that I gave a 5-star rating. This is the 5-star rating that I told you about at the beginning, my first for the month and also for the year. It's hard to rate people's lives, um, and I feel like a lot of people feel that way. So just overall enjoyment of listening to Saru tell his story and um, I guess just the pace at which he did. I'm sure there could have been a lot of filler to make it a, a more robust or a longer story to tell, um, but it just, it was in it its simplest form, I feel like, and just a really intriguing story. Um, crazy to think that what happened to him has probably happened to multiple children. Um, especially in underdeveloped or third world countries. So for those of you that don't know, um, this is the true story of Saru when he was a young boy living in India. He was five years old when he um, boarded a train, uh, fell asleep on the train while waiting for his brother, and ended up journeying um, miles and miles and miles from his home. He attempted to hop back on trains uh, to get back to where he was from, but he was a poor child living in rural India. Um, his vocabulary was very limited and his speech was not the best. So him trying to explain where he was from, um, he, he thought he was pronouncing the names of cities and the villages around him correctly. He was not, um, and he couldn't explain what he needed and where he needed to be. So he, he ended up in, um, an orphanage that, uh, attempts to find the homes of kids who get separated from their family in India. And after an ad I've been saying this like the British way for a long time, the advertisement, the advertisement, <laughs> um, went out into newspapers where they thought might be closest to his hometown. Um, after that went out uh, and nobody responded to the advertisement, um, he was deemed an orphan and then went into the system to be adopted and ended up getting adopted by a couple who live in Tasmania. Um, who always felt it was their dream and destiny to adopt a, um, a child uh, from an underdeveloped part of the world. So Saru grows up and lives with them. They end up adopting another kid from India. And um, when he's in his late 20s, he has never been able to let go of this family that he lost or that he was lost from. And at that point, the Facebook wasn't yet a thing. Um, email was very professional use only. So the only real thing he could use was Google Earth. And he spoke with um, like family and friends who knew India, uh, who were from India, um, people who knew the train systems and worked on the train lines and could kind of help him figure out a section um, near Kolkata, which is where he was found, that he could use as a search um, section, basically. So he then used Google Earth to follow the train lines. Um, each and every train line that went out of Kolkata until he found where he thought he was from and he miraculously found his home village and was reunited with his family. And it's just a beautiful story. It's also a movie, um, which is why it got the new title of Lion. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a beautiful story, like I said, so I would really recommend it. Um, I just, I think it's a great one for, um, hope and just other things, um, especially right now. So, yeah, there's that. And then the last physical book I had was The Fork, the Witch, and the Worm by Christopher Pellini, which is Tales from Allegasia, Volume 1, um, which follows 
or we get back to a time with Aragon after the events of the Inheritance Cycle. This was a 281 page book. I gave a three star rating and there's three different stories within here that uh, kind of explain what's going on in the world since and also kind of prior to uh, what happened in in the inheritance cycle. It was just really fun to be back in this world and to be back with Aragon and kind of live in that again. Um, Christopher Polini mentioned that he thought whenever he visited this world it would be in a full-length novel, but he wrote the story of the worm um, in between writing uh, books for a sci-fi series that he's working on. And so from there he just kind of developed it into something that could be published and wrote two more stories to go along with it and it's just a lot of fun. I think you'll gain the most out of this obviously if you have those nostalgic feelings for the inheritance cycle and grew up reading them and want more of that world. Um, so I did really enjoy this. So those are the 12 books I read this month. I read a total of 1,701 pages and listened to 84 hours and 24 minutes worth of books. My average star rating was a 3.5, which I think might be my highest for the year so far. Um, I'm just blown away that I've had three months in a row now where I've read 12 books <laughs> and especially this month having books that um, I've rated so highly. So I would love to know if you participated in any of the three readathons I mentioned at the start of this video. Um, I'd also love to know what your stats were and maybe what your favorite read for the month was. So if you feel so inclined, please do let me know down in the comments below and I will chat with you there until my next video. Bye!